Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This week on the Sweetwater Minute, we are joined by a very special guest. Dave Weckel is here. Hi, Mitch. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. We're glad to have me. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having me. So you're here doing a workshop on behalf of Yamaha, and you're going to be doing an intensive uh, workshop tomorrow as well. That's right. Exciting stuff. We're looking forward to hearing you play. And, Thank you. And uh, checking Thank the whole you. thing out. It sounds great. We're listening to the sounds out in the hall. And well, it's nice to be here in a real hall. We've been, we've been stuck in sound corners in certain stores and you know so it's nice to come here and like have a real place to to do it yeah the theater's right. amazing yeah, yeah the theater's great. absolutely it's amazing yeah. right right so you came out of st louis moved to the east coast and how did you get yourself worked into the new york scene and start picking up gigs early on well uh i was lucky enough to get involved in a band in college in bridgeport uh, where i went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, University of Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, a few guys from the college band that had a, had a band together called Night Sprite. And that band started to gain a little bit of popularity and notoriety and within Westchester County in New York City. And we started to get some good gigs and you know, invited uh, Peter Erskine and Steve Kahn to come down and check it out one time. And that was right. sort of, uh, and we were playing actually at the uh, Brecker Brothers Club, 7th Avenue South in Manhattan. And that was kind of our big prestigious gig that we got, you know. Right. Yeah, we were a bunch of kids. We were 22 years old, you know, at that point. Sure. You know, 21, 22. And, um, and, you know, Peter liked an, what he heard enough. I had been bugging him for a while anyway, writing him letters and sending him tapes and stuff, you know, for mm -hmm. a couple of years. And, uh, and he recommended me for the um, uh, French Toast gig that he couldn't do. And that was the precursor of the Michelle Camillo band. So... That's kind of how the whole thing happened um, that I kind of got into the scene. It was because of that. Right, yeah. right. And you had some other high-powered recommendations as well, Anthony Jackson. Well, Anthony Peter. played with Michelle's band and the French Toast gig, and Anthony then started recommending me for everything, and it was a, kind of a, just a freight train effect started to happen within the, within the uh, studio circuit, and then I got the Simon and Garfunkel gig that, that Anthony was on. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing a lot of studio stuff in Manhattan, still playing with Michelle, and that's when Chick heard me with um, with Mich one of Michelle's records. Right. Was, so that was the beginning of the electric band. Right. You know, and in and the record you just mentioned a little while ago, the Bill Connors record, I was actually playing with Bill Connors and Tom Kennedy at the Bottom Line in New York, and Chick walked in. <laughs> right. It's right. like I saw him. I was like, yeah. right. <laughs> you know. And, and he was there, and I was like, wow, that was, that, was, so that was sort of my audition for the electric band, unbeknownst to me. Wow, no, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So one of the things that, uh, that I, I uh, have noticed about looking back at the things that you've done is you always have your hands in a lot of different areas. You have a lot of projects going on. I think you're more diverse than just about anybody we've had on the Sweetwater Minute as far as interviews go. You're oh, singles well. projects, you're, you're doing a pledge project right now. How does that work? Well, yeah, I've always enjoyed, you know, many facets of the business. I try to teach that to kids when I, when I do teach, to, to try to think outside the box a little bit and realize it's the music business and try to diversify as much as possible and not just kind of limit yourself to one thing, even just being a drummer. You know, if sure. I had to just be a drummer, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be living, you know, uh, wouldn't be making the living that I'm making, not that I'm making a ton of money, but it's I'm comfortable and I'm, but it's because I diversify, you know, I try to try right. to spread it out and do mixing jobs. I'm into the sound, I'm into the engineering thing, mm -hmm. um, the instructional aspect, you know, trying to make, you know, uh, instructional products for a long time and, uh, and yeah, making records, trying to write music. Um, the Pledge Music Project is the current project um, with my partner, Jay Oliver, who was my childhood friend when we were teenagers we grew up together he was on all my early records with GRP and Stretch mm -hmm. and uh, from Concord and then um, you know 13 years go by and we haven't done a project and I don't have a record deal anymore I actually didn't want one I gave it back because I wasn't wasn't really liking the direction the record companies were taking and sure they were just kind of keeping all the rights and not really helping us that much you know it was, with our with our thing it wasn't like we were like a big star band or anything you know it was like a you know, fusion band. And they, so I just said, you know what, here, take the contract back, man. It's not really working out, you know, for me this way. So and that was 2007. And, um, but we decided we wanted to do another project and, and uh, we were going to go with the Kickstarter type of thing. And, and um, but our friend Chrissy Poland, great singer in New York, um, introduced us to the Pledge music people. Mm -hmm. And it's a Kickstarter-like type of thing in that it's crowdfunding, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different in that it's only music. Okay. 
Um, so they're, and it turns out the guys, uh, you know, uh, Jason, I forget the, Dave, I think, I forget the guys, I met their name, I'm sorry. Um, but they're fans and they're drummers, you know, so they, you know, they, they really helped us get, get the thing going and, you know, it just felt like, a, like the right thing to do. And um, we kind of put a pitch video, video together and threw it out there to see if there were still enough fans that, you know, that cared enough to invest in the project and allow us to stay home and do it for a few months at a time. Right. And I have to say, it, it exceeded my, my wildest expectations. You know, the, the people really s stepped up. I mean, we were offering some cool stuff, though, too. Yeah. I mean, you know, just... Uh, you know, sticks and play along stuff and, you know, different, you know, DVD and, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, I mean. A day the in the studio with the band? Day in the studio and we did that last April, you know, we did, we did all that and, um, you know, the, the, one of the, one, a friend of ours actually who was helping a, a, a friend of ours that was um, in a cancer um, uh, situation and he was part of this, uh, the crowd at, at, in Kansas City. He, he put up, him and his brothers put up the $15,000 pledge for us to come play there Wow! as part of that whole thing. So yeah, we had some, some high dollar um, tier investment, you know, places mm -hmm. on the thing and, and, and people stepped up, you know, there we, I think we were up to about 2,200 pledgers now and, and um, you know we've 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 raised a good amount of money so that we can stay home and do it. You know, and it was right. quite honestly probably twice as much as any record company has ever given me for a budget. So, right. so, um, but the, the, on the other side of that, the project has turned into this mega, 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 mega project, and it's taking us forever to finish it because now every time I go to the studio or when I went to the studio, we're bas we're basically almost finished with it now, and we're actually released um, almost all the songs to the pledgers. So. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of coming out soon. Um, but, you know, every time I went to the studio, it wasn't like, you know, just, okay, fire Pro Tools and record, you know, and then, ah, let me do another take, let me do another take, I, you know, put them together later. No, every time I went out there, it was five cameras rolling and, you know, I had to, like, actually had to put on clothes and, like, think about <laughs> what I looked like instead of just going to my studio, which is outside my door. Right. And it was a real different thing, but it kind of was cool because it put me into a different performance head, too. It was like, you know, you get kind of used to per performing with the Pro Tools as a cushion to say, ah, we can piece it together later or whatever. It's not that, you know. But right. this was like, well, man, if we're going to do that with cameras, the editing would be would take for like 10 years, you know. So it all of a sudden put me into a performance head of trying to really get the take. Mm -hmm you know, right away. So it was, it was interesting, interesting right. thing. So, but yeah, we're on the, we're on the, uh, we're almost out of the pledge phase now. We're, we're delivering and, and uh, so far it's getting really good reviews from the people that invested. So we're happy to be finally give it to them. But it, yeah. it should be out in about a month uh, to the public. Oh, very yeah. exciting, yeah. very exciting. So you're, uh, you mentioned you have a studio outside your door. You're also an engineer and a producer. How did you pick up those skills? Yeah, I, I, it, the word producer is a little bit, it's a, it's a little bit of a reach. I'm, I produce my own stuff because I know how I want it to sound, but, and I kind of am able to do that within, with the people that I work with, mm -hmm. uh, okay. But, but uh, engineering, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really into it. I'm, it's part of the, you know, the presentation for me. I dig the, you know, learning about the aspect of the recording and, and um, you know, getting, getting what I do or what anybody does transferred to tape, you know, mm -hmm. and getting it, getting it out there represented so that it conveys the emotion, you know, and and that's a tough one with starting with drums, you know, not a lot of engineers understand that unless they kind of have some drum drumming background, you know. Right. But even in the clinic today, I just, you know, it's like everything goes into my mixer and it's like, you know. Get yourself you know, contained. It's like, and I just kind of do it because it's it's all preset, sort of know what it's going to be and mm -hmm. done it long enough now to, to kind of have a handle on what, what I would like it to sound like. And then it's, it's quicker. It's just like right. instead of trying to tell somebody what, you know, tactfully what to do. It's just like, dude, just fire up the system and look, I got it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, sure. And it's, it's easier for everybody. So, sure, yeah. sure. Do you find a, a lot of uh, musicians that I talk to, and of course we have a lot of home studio owners, project studio owners that are customers here at Sweetwater, do you find it difficult to separate the two hats, the technical engineering side of it from the musician performer side of it as you're making or recording your takes? Uh, no, it's not difficult to separate it. It's difficult to remember that I have to go back and practice. Because once I take this hat off and I go sit down and I start the mixing process and, and, you know, well, I mean, actually, it gets a little bit convoluted when I try to do all the engineering myself in the recording phase. Okay. That's a little bit difficult. So I usually have at least an assistant helping me that, that can kind of take the pressure off, of, off okay. of me, even though I have a remote system at my drums and I generally do it that way. 
when I'm in the middle of a heavy project, especially if we're recording more than one person, if it's just me layering, then I sort of do it myself and I'm, if I'm first. But, but if I'm recording with a four or five piece band in my room, it's like I gotta, I gotta have help. You know, I don't wanna have right. to wear all those hats. It's too, 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 too much stress. And I don't really do that anymore. I tried that one or two times and I said, no, can't do that anymore. You know? right. But it's, it's not, it's, not it's, it's just the problem is, is that I don't really consider myself as, as knowledgeable or as good at what I do at the mixing board as I know what I'm doing there. I've been doing this that forever and I'm, the mixing thing is like a continuous experimentation for me. So I'm still learning and I spend a lot more time than I should mixing. I'm not very fast, but, but I kind of feel like I get the, the end result eventually after mix 17 or something. Right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? So I keep going back and doing it. But, um, but yeah, I think the, you know, if there was a message to give to the, to the studio owners is, is uh, Boy, really pay attention to your room, you mm -hmm. know, because because you can get killer mic pre's and great speakers and nice, you know, you know, microphones and and uh, great signal path and get it all recorded very cleanly. But man, if you're not, if your room doesn't allow you to hear right, holy cow! I actually learned a lesson that I had been listening to my mixes through my killer barefoot, you know, Micromade 27 speakers. Right. And I was missing like all these frequencies. We actually ran the that test, you know. Sure, like, sweep, oh sure. my God, man, I, we were missing. So I had to actually like set up an EQ for playback so that, <laughs> I, so that I wasn't missing those frequencies. Right. And that kind of got the mixing game going a little bit faster. Yeah. So, but the, the room is really important. So they gotta, gotta at least be able to tune it so you hear all the frequencies where you're sitting in front of the mix position. Right. Otherwise you're adding all the stuff, you take it out to the car and it's like, I didn't hear that in there, you know? Right, so, yeah, right, so right, exactly. It's a game, a little bit of a game, but it's fun. Yeah, you gotta be able to hear in order to, to yeah. mix accurately. Yeah. Right. One of the things that I found interesting is um, after you're already very well established as a master drummer, you've gone back and studied uh, with uh, with people like uh, the late Freddie Gruber or mm -hmm. people like that. Why did you decide to go back and study with someone like that and what did you get out of that? Well, I mean, hopefully knowledge or the, the you know, the, the quest for it never stops. I mean, I think if you, you stop wanting to learn, you're dead. You know, mm -hmm. you might as well just, co you know, roll it up in the ball and, you know, whatever <laughs> and just forget about it. So, you know, I, I kind of always have that quest, you know, to, to learn more about what it is I'm involved in and, and even stuff I'm not involved in. but. Um, but at that time in my life, which was about, man, we're, put, we're going on 20 years now, probably, you know, 17 years ago, um, when, I, when I finally got off the road for a minute, um, after I left Chick and other things, I, I, you know, Steve Smith said, hey, you gotta go check out Freddie, because I, I was watching Steve just like progress and like jump leaps and bounds, and some other players too, you know, um, Adam Nussbaum went and studied with him, and some other, some other players, you know, and I was like, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I have to admit, I never gave Freddie the benefit of the doubt. If I would see him coming, you know, at festivals, I'd be like, oh no, I'm out of here. I don't want to listen to the stories again, you know? So, he, cause he was such a character, man. But, um, but I, I grew that, you know, I, I always remember the, you know, it, it, it kind of comes full circle now because it's, I think Abe Lincoln was the one that had the quote, um, you know, I don't like that person so much. I'm gonna have to get to know him. Right. You know what I mean? Cause it's yeah. like, you have this visualization or, you, or, or unless you really know the person, mm -hmm. you know, you don't get the full story. You sure. know what I mean? So yeah. I'm really glad I gave him the chance because it turned into a wonderful relationship. And I, you know, it's, uh, you know, sad to see him cycle life take over and, sure. and leave. But um, man, the, the, you know, it was the, some of the most profound study that I ever did. You know, mm -hmm. It was killer. It was just really just, just got me to understand things that no one ever told me before. And it wasn't so much about drumming. It was more about just how energy flow and laws of physics and things that I wouldn't think Freddie would know too much about. You know, again, right. it's that, you know, that, that misconception of, you know, um, profiling, if, if you were, you know, and I was like, man, right. it's like, boy, was I guilty of that. So. Um, so it just kind of put me into another place of, of um, learning more about myself and about how this works back here and, and to make it easier to do. And that's kind of what I'm trying to carry on in, in the clinics and the teaching and you know, all that stuff is to, to share that with people so that they maybe can check it out and understand it. Help right. them be a little more free to create. Yeah. yeah, sometimes after you're a bit more developed, you're more ready to receive that kind of information from somebody as well. So coming into it with a lot of experience behind you, you're probably better equipped to absorb than if you had gone in as a beginner. 
Yeah, I'm not so sure about that, yeah. but yeah, because I kind of wish somebody would have, you know, would have showed me a long time ago the, what I know about it now from Freddie's point of view. I, I kind of went about it, not the wrong way, but a, but a very physically difficult way for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, and and um, it's a it's a it's a big difference with the approach concept that he had, and and boy, it's really it's really helped my longevity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a kid anymore, and I'm I'm still able to kind of play the way I want, even even with injury, I'm I'm able to do it because of the because of his approach. You know, so. right, right. Yeah. So we've had uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, very high level musicians on the Sweetwater Minute. Chick Corea is, is one we've had here, and I always ask the same question, and that is, what is it that makes a great artist? You've worked with so many of these people too, Mike Stern, you're working with Oz Noy, um, obviously Chick, John Patitucci, Anthony Jackson, all these people. What is it that really sets them apart and makes them an outstanding artist? Uh, that's how much time you got. <laughs> um, In five words or less. It's a little bit of a loaded question because, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's somebody with a, it's somebody with a, a vision, somebody with an undying um, passion to, um, to do whatever it takes to, to get to that vision. Mm -hmm. And um, someone's not afraid to do it their own way. Okay. You know what I mean? That yep. they live by their world of what they create, you know, and, and, and that's their place. And they, they go with that and are not afraid to, to be influenced or, or inspired or work with or, or come together with other people, you know, mm -hmm. that, that help, help them be the artists they are, you know. Yeah, right, yeah, right. I guess right. That's I had to answer it. No, oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. A question a little bit along the same lines. Drummers obviously spend a lot of time working on groove. But a lot of the people that are watching these videos are not drummers, they're other musicians, guitar players, bass players, keyboards. What can those musicians do to improve their groove so when they go in and play with a great drummer, the whole thing is more solid and, and feels great? I used to tell, um, it was a funny thing, is I got, I got like Frank Abali to do it when he was, you know, back in the electric band days and just other musicians. And I used to try to get them to, because uh, I would notice them play and I would notice their feet like be all over the place, you know. They had no independence to actually keep a quarter note going and do what they were doing so that they could fit what they were doing into the pocket, you know. And so I, I suggested to them to try to just do some very simple independent drum study, you know, mm -hmm. of, just, of just literally with their hands and their feet on the floor, you know, just, just eighth notes, two and four, one and three, and quarter notes on the left foot, you know, just four-way independence, mm -hmm. and then kind of expand on that and try to listen to simple drum fill, drum uh, grooves, and do that four-way independence, and then you do what the, um, my other profound uh, study was with Gary Chester mm -hmm. back in the early 80s, and his whole thing was about independence and adding the, fi the voice as a fifth independence. So you would sing each of those limbs, you would sing the quarter note against all this, you know. And I said, and if you really want to get crazy, you do all that and then you pick a simple rhythm line and read it with your left hand, you mm -hmm. know. At, and that's kind of the beginnings of the Gary Chester system. But, but um, and that book is New Breed, by the way, which all drummers should go through. Um, it's very frustrating for independence, but it's really great. Right. Um, so, so I think that one is, is important, to try to get the independence going within your body so it's not one-dimensional. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of musicians have, um, that don't have drum knowledge tend to be very um, focused on what they're doing. Sure. But, and so it's hard to separate that and hear it within the pocket, within the time. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, I think that, that's, a good, that's a good one. That's great. Fun, yeah. Yeah, 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 great, something to work on. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So you've been with Yamaha for 30 years. This is your 30 year anniversary I have, tour. Yeah. I have. What, uh, what drew you to Yamaha and what has kept you with them for all these years? Very simple. Sound of the drums, the people mm -hmm. that played them when I was young, um, everybody that I heard that I liked. What drums are you using, Yamaha? Without, without fail. So mm -hmm. uh, any drum that I played, I tried to get it to sound like Yamaha when I, before I had the endorsement. And I actually had a custom made kit made in New York that that uh, was one of the first ones to have real deep square sizes, you know, back in 1980, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, it's I was so happy to get the get the gig or get the get the drums when I was with the Simon and Garfunkel band. That's when they came to me and said, "Hey, would you you know be interested?" I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." But <laughs> you guys got to make me some deep shell drums, you know. Okay. That's really what I want to do. And that was so that was the beginning of the whole power stuff. Mm -hmm. It wasn't made then, you know. Nobody was doing that yet. So. Um, 
so that was the you know that was it. But I you know for me it's it's uh, the instrument just allows me to be me. You know I can tune them fast. The hardware is faultless. It doesn't you know fall apart. It uh, allows me to be comfortable where I'm at with my with my playing position. I can put things exactly where I want them. Adjust everything. And it's just that it's just the quality. The quality right. and the and the quality control about what they're what they're doing with the stuff. Even the new stuff made in China is the same way. It's the same quality control that was in Japan. So it's mm -hmm. it's um, I was just at the factory actually in China and it's like you know, incredible. I got all the Japanese guys training them there and you know right. and, and it's killing. I mean it's great. So so basically it's it's the sound of the instrument, mm -hmm. the the feel of the instrument is why I'm why I play anything. You know, it's gotta it's gotta represent what my vision is. Right. Yeah. right. Wonderful. And, and they do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're so grateful that they brought you in here tonight. We've got, like I said, a public uh, workshop here. That, and then tomorrow, you're doing the private intensive workshop, which is a, a small group thing that you do, which yeah, is very I'm, cool. Yeah, I'm sort of tagging that on on top of the clinic tour here that almost in every city, that I'm, I'm doing this uh, one day intensive for, you know, 15 maximum in the class. And, and it's a seven, eight hour day, so it's a long day. And it's as close to kind of one on one. But I, I really go through the whole thing with the Freddie stuff and making sure they you know, the students understand the approach that Freddie taught me, and then uh, and then there's two drum kits set up. We play, and I'm you know I'm the other I'm the band member. I'm not the other drummer. They got to make me feel comfortable. So right, they, right. Saying that's your gig. You got to no distractions. You have to make me feel good and play. And we play together, and it's it's cool. It's by the end of the day, they kind of got a lot of things to think about, you know, for their own for yeah. their own stuff. So it's fun. What well, an awesome fun. experience. A lot of takeaways yeah, cool. for the students too. Yeah, so it is. It's cool. Very cool. It's cool. Dave, thanks so much for coming in. All right, Mitch. Really appreciate My your time. Pleasure talking to you. My honor pleasure. to have you here. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Cool. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. <laughs>